um, help make it possible at PwC. Ron and the gang there really do an amazing job. Locally owned, operated, Vice President Ron um, handles it here. And I have to say, it's a nice thing to get done before the holidays, before Thanksgiving, if you're going to have people over. Um, give PwC a call. Uh, PwC does a great job, and they take care of it all. Um, from window washing to, uh, you know, detailing of cars to everything that you need taken care of. Um, so thank you, PwC. Now, I am so happy to have our special guests in the studio. Um, really interesting people. I was talking to Naomi Niskala and her wonderful daughter, Mia, who's here with Robert Pollock from Ebb and Flow Arts. Um, and you get to bring so many wonderful people yeah. into Maui, <clears throat> Robert, with your ebb and flow arts programs. You're just amazing what you're able it's to another, arrange. It's another miracle. It Sunday. is another miracle. I mean, just are you the travel agent that arranges all these flights <laughs> no. and books them all as well? Or how do you arrange uh, all these people no. you bring in? Well, it, usually it's they arrange it and we reimburse their travel. So, Because that, that's a lot. I mean, and no. Naomi's going to play this coming... Friday at a, an mm. absolutely beautiful church. I yeah. love that church. Have you had a chance to see the church yet, Naomi? No, I'm going tomorrow morning. It's an um. historic church that's really beloved by the community mm. here. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's perhaps the most beautiful setting, right? It is. It's just you know it, right on the bay with the wonderful grounds and this old stone church. Uh, it's it's it, the trees. It's, it's historic. It's a wonderful uh, spot for us, and we've been there over the years a number of times has, has been a while but we're very happy to return uh, this will be kahu alika's final program with us he's retiring oh, i didn't know he that he's been doing it so long yeah and he's such a wonderful host you oh know, yeah he makes the point it's not just a venue you know it's the environment it's the spirituality of the place that oh the vibe enjoy. there is yeah, amazing exactly. amazing we're talking about the keavali um beautiful mm. mckenna is I pronouncing it wrong? That's Close enough? <laughs> Congregational an Church in McKenna. And and yeah. I just like going down there early and taking pictures. You can see the, yeah. the beautiful historic graveyard there as well. Right. And the lovely palm trees and this beautiful stone structure that mm -hmm. is um, so so wonderful. So it's this Friday at 7.30, and, um, and it's going to be a, a lovely thing. Now, what, what, how did you connect with Naomi, and how did this come about where she's going to be doing this piano uh, recital? Well, <clears throat> one of our first productions here in 2000 were two recitals by the composer-pianist Robert Helps. He's since passed away. He passed away in 2003, perhaps. Uh, it, w it turned out that th these were his next-to-last recitals. He was a teacher of mine. Oh, I didn't know and that. And he's rather renowned as a composer and pianist. Um, so we knew of his work, of course. And then we started to hear about this pianist who had taken it upon herself to record the complete works, the complete piano works of Robert Helps. And that was, of course, Naomi. Mm. And eventually we made contact, and she sent her beautiful CDs. Beautiful it's a CDs, two, yeah. two CD set of the complete works, and they're, it's a wonderful uh, performances of very challenging music by a, himself a piano virtuoso. Historic in many and, ways, and then, yeah. is a so, document. So those. we contacted her, and we made a point to eventually hopefully bring her out to play some of these works as well as others and so uh, it's happening and that, that's why I say it's it's a miracle you know uh, there's a former New York Times critic Paul Griffiths who wrote once not too long ago Feldman in Hawaii you're working miracles meaning Morton Feldman the composer and who would have thought in Hawaii but no these are th this is a program beautifully conceived by Naomi that includes two major works by Robert Helps, also a work by his teacher, Roger Sessions, a great American composer, and some a classic by Arnold Schoenberg, Opus 19, six short pieces, as well as Leos Janacek and 
Vivian Fine. All 20th century, but all for you out there, don't get intimidated. It's a beautifully made program. The music is largely tonal based. The most abstract work is the Schoenberg, written in 1911 or something like that, 1912. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, Naomi is going to begin the program with those. So, uh, my feeling is it's like uh, cleansing the ear palate, you know, just for, for you out there, just it will be a piece, these are tiny pieces, miniatures, one minute each, six of them. And they're extremely... That is really short. They're one very minute each short. Is, is like, that's amazing. That's it had really to short. do with, my understanding was that at that time, his group, Schoenberg's group said, let's erase everything from the past. Let's make a clean slate. Wow. Let's not refer to anything <laughs> that we've ever heard. And most of these, Schoenberg certainly was a master of tonality. But he said, let's, at that point, let's clear it. And so what resulted were these really distilled gems. They like and expression marks? They, yeah. Little yeah. exclamation marks yes. and other notations? Yeah. And so once you hear those, then you're ready for what follows in the program, which uh -huh. will, again, will not be that wild. In fact, <laughs> the, the Schoenberg is probably, uh -huh. in a sense, the wildest. Uh -huh. But uh, you're prepared for the uh, extended tonality of the the rest of the program. Well, thank is that, you. Is that a fair yes, interpretation so, of, yeah. of yeah. your <laughs> conception well, of the piece? Of I the had program? a chance to chat a little bit with Naomi and her, her darling daughter Mia um, before we came on the air, and it was so cute because uh, when I travel and I travel quite often, you see these days. Um, kids come with their their backpacks mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you had a, uh, an amazing array <laughs> of magic tricks <laughs> and food and desserts and all these little things in a pink backpack of course right and and so it's interesting to see how you customize mm -hmm. A backpack, and and I don't know how much say Mia had in it, but you yeah, look pretty a, organized. She has a lot of that, that's her backpack from school, and she's got some colored pencils and some books and some paper in there, and and you had a lunch, right? It's yeah. a pretty long flight from Pennsylvania. To it here. was, it yeah. was, yeah. yes. And you're going from <laughs> a lot colder weather there than what you have mm -hmm. here. Have mm -hmm. you, you ever been in Maui before? Uh, it, probably about 25 years ago. Oh wow, it's but changed yeah. a lot. I you know somebody named Maui. Well, from that's Moana. wow. Oh. From oh, they named it from the Disney movie, huh? Oh. Interesting, isn't that interesting? Now the people can call Maui. Mm -hmm. Maui. Um, <laughs> so so, and it's interesting how different kids travel as mm -hmm. well. You know, I, I hate to see people generalize and say, "Oh my gosh, I don't want to sit next to a kid mm -hmm. when I'm mm -hmm. traveling." You know, because every kid is different, just like every mm -hmm. person is. Some mm -hmm. kids hate traveling. Mm -hmm. And some kids, I see them just get right into what mm -hmm. they want to do, mm -hmm. whether it's coloring mm -hmm. or reading. And mm -hmm. they sit down, and I see them focus, and mm -hmm. next thing, they're going at it, mm -hmm. right? So so what kind of traveler is Mia? She's a good traveler. She's had to do it from the beginning, whether it's plane rides or really long car rides. Oh. Ah, so, yeah, yeah, her first trip, she was five months old, and she went to Kosovo with me. Whoa. Yeah, so she obviously <laughs> doesn't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> but she's she's a good traveler, and she can entertain herself, and she spent most of the first two flights, I think, Were you playing drawing. in Kosovo? I was, yeah, yeah. How did you arrange it? Do you book your own things, or do you have an agent booking? No, that I was uh, playing with a group that was based in Berlin, and, oh, boy, when was this? Maybe tw 2012? Like we started doing some outreach in Kosovo, um, so I did, I think, three trips over there. Wow. Yeah. So and, and did you, pl do you when you do these mm -hmm. concerts? Mm -hmm. I love some of the old concert halls mm -hmm. in Europe and around. Mm -hmm. Did you get to play in a concert hall, an opera house? We, or we actually were at a school. The the artistic director and founder of the this group at Spectrum Concerts Berlin um, was traveling there with a friend and stumbled upon this music school. Basically, he just heard you know music students practicing and stumbled across this school um, that was quite run down in disarray and became interested in trying to, you know, to offer help there. Uh -huh. So um, we would go over and, and give lessons and master classes and, and play play in the school, but it was, um, 
it was, it, you know, sometimes the heat wasn't running and, and uh-huh. things like that. But, um, yeah, so it was um, so very had, interesting trips. You had yes. translators. We, we did, yes, we yeah. did, yes. Mm-hmm. But the good thing about mm-hmm. music mm-hmm. is that uh, music mm-hmm. itself doesn't need translation. And I Correct, love that yes. there's a universal mm-hmm. language mm-hmm. in music. Mm-hmm. I have so many friends who are musicians. And a lot of people, and I don't know how many Hawaiian musicians mm-hmm. you've had a chance to meet yet here mm-hmm. on this trip, mm-hmm. but I have many, many friends who are Hawaiian that actually can survive and make money by sure. going to Japan. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. you know, there's such a, a wonderful plethora of great musicians here. We appreciate them and love them, but they don't get paid much at all, or mm-hmm. many times they're asked to play for nonprofit events mm-hmm. and things like that. Sure. So they sure. probably could not survive mm-hmm. in just playing here. Mm-hmm. And like many places, musicians have to have second mm-hmm. jobs if they're musicians, right? So there's a whole flock of musicians here that are going to Japan sure. mm-hmm. and selling out stadiums. Mm-hmm. It's huge mm-hmm. there now. There's mm-hmm. hula halau is there mm-hmm. now. There's people that are have huge fan bases. There's mm-hmm. this music thing. And I was surprised to hear that you actually uh, grew up in Japan. I did. From the age of 13 to 18, my mother's Japanese and um so my father worked for Eastman Kodak and asked to be able to go over there for, for three or five years. In Tokyo? And in Tokyo to, to the R&D Center. And so they ended up, um, they were there for four years, and that put it for me at the end of my junior year of high school. And I, I didn't want to go back for one year. So I stayed for a fifth year with friends of my parents um, and finished up high school there. Was there a um, different take? Did you feel that it was a different attitude in Japan oh, about absolutely. music than here? Uh, oh, me- oh, yeah, sh- certainly, uh-huh. certainly. And, and um, it, was, it was a tough change. I had grown up in upstate New York in Rochester, and so uh-huh. Eastman School of Music was just down the door, and I, I was there in their prep division for guys probably since I was eight. Um, and it was a lot of fun, and a lot of my friends played there, and, you know, I was probably at Eastman for weeknights a week and then all day Saturday with lessons and classes. A lot of work. Yeah, great, great community and and a lot of friends and great teachers. Um, And then, you know, moving to Japan, the the teaching was very different. Um, And I actually uh, quit for a while. It was was just too drastic of a change. Is it intense? It depends. Yeah, so the the first teacher I had there was was not not a not a great fit, um, <laughs> and so I actually I, I quit. Um, but I would go back to the states in the summer, and I went back my first summer and met with my teachers there, and decided to to keep playing, and and had yet another teacher. And, and in the end, I had three teachers, and the last one was really wonderful, and I I studied with her for I think three years. You know, it's interesting because mm-hmm. I've studied Zen, and um, mm-hmm. there's a whole huge difference in the mm-hmm. Japanese Zen tradition versus mm-hmm. what happens in San Francisco and the Zen area there versus here. And China. And, 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 and yeah. Korea, and, and, and in music, I hear sometimes that it's a lot stricter. And even mm. sometimes Japanese parents can be pretty demanding of their students, what mm-hmm. I've heard, mm-hmm. um, as far as making their kids mm-hmm. work hard. I don't think mm-hmm. Mia has to have, although you're taking lessons now, Mia, I don't think you have that kind of problem with a mother being super disciplined well, with you playing no, well. No. <laughs> my, you know, there's the rule that you don't study with parents, and, and uh, there's nobody really in our area to, to teach her. And so uh-huh. she, she's been very tolerant, but I'll, I'll be teaching her and think, oh, my goodness, if this wasn't my child, I'd, I'd have ten times the patience I do now. <laughs> but she, she puts up with it, and I think, I think you, like, you like your piano lessons so far, yeah? That's yeah. good. She's nodding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and it's so, like, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, it's so important mm-hmm. that you have a good match mm-hmm. with the teacher. Mm, yes. It mm-hmm. shouldn't be murder. It shouldn't be something <laughs> that kids dread that they're forced to do. Yeah. It should make them inspired. It should make them sure. excited. And sometimes I've seen young children or mm-hmm. young people sit down, and you've seen this, Robert, where they just let their whole soul and their imagination take off mm-hmm. when they sit at the piano and it's like another world opens up. Mm-hmm. And those children are very sensitive and have mm-hmm. to have the right teachers because if they were taught the mm-hmm. wrong way, it would mm-hmm. limit their sure. inspiration mm-hmm. and their passion for their music, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That's a fine balance between you need to have the discipline and to be able to do that, to be free at the instrument. So it's, it's, there is some enjoyment, but there is hard work and finding the right balance. Yeah. So where does that meet in in you finding that passion versus mm-hmm. obviously the dedication mm-hmm. and discipline it takes mm-hmm. to have the right technique? Because mm-hmm. there's a lot of there's a lot of intricate technique in what sure. you're doing, mm-hmm. but then there has to be room for more than just the notes being mm-hmm. played right. Yeah, yeah. Well, for me, it's um, 
you know, I, I started very young. I was three, so it obviously three. it wasn't my choice. It was my mother's choice. Oh my! Um, and she had always wanted to play and, and wasn't able to, so I I became the one to play. Um, and so I, I always, you know, played, and, and things were very easy for me technically and musically. So I was uh -huh. very lucky, but I, I didn't really have to practice, and I enjoyed it. Um, but I never intended to go into music at all, ever. Interesting. So I, I, um, I loved animals as a kid, and I wanted to be a vet. I wanted to be a vet, too, <laughs> but as soon as I found out how much blood and cutting was involved, I went, well, see, no, that, I that didn't. That didn't bother me. But yeah. <laughs> so I, for, you know, for college, I, I had no intentions of going into music, and um, I was over in Japan. But you were still playing. Um, kind of, sort of. I yeah. mean, I, I could get away with 40 minutes a day a few times a week of practice, and, and I could swing it. Um, and so for college, I it was a decision between Tufts and Cornell, both of which had good vet schools. And I thought, you know, I should go to Tufts. Being in Tokyo for five years, Ithaca was a little bit too small of a town. And it was my parents were back in Rochester, and I thought it was too close to home. So I chose <laughs> Tufts. And right before I enrolled, they had a, I found out they had a double degree program with the New England Conservatory. Oh, nice. It was five years. It was the same, same cost of <laughs> tuition. So I thought I'd do that, get some free lessons. And then, you know, after three years, drop out of the conservatory and just continue at Tufts. And I had an amazing teacher who I remember the first semester I would show up for lessons. And, and in Japan, you're, you're told, you know, do this, do that. Go listen to this recording, copy that, ah. um, which is very different from the yeah. way I was brought up. And so I would go into my lessons the entire first semester. She'd say, well, Naomi, I'm not convinced. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs> and I would just, you know, leave. And I, I don't know what to do. And, and something clicked. And by the time I started my sophomore year, I, I, I was playing for myself for the first time. I'd Yay. always played for somebody else. Isn't that nice? You know? And so I, I and went. Th that changed it. It changed. And I, I went home for Christmas break, sophomore year. And I told my parents, I'm, I'm dropping out of Tufts. And I'm just going to continue at the conservatory. And my mother had always wanted me to be a pianist. So she was, wow. <laughs> luckily, you know, I had supportive parents. Because a lot of parents would say, absolutely not. <laughs> You know, and so I, that was a switch. And yeah. and you told me something that mm -hmm. amazed me, which mm -hmm. I, I think is an interesting subject, which is mm -hmm. the universality of what's mm -hmm. going on in colleges. Mm -hmm. That your school, mm -hmm. right, I guess a college, mm -hmm. is 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 now looking to, um, in fact, is asking people mm -hmm. to go to a, another to Europe and to other places. Sure. To yeah. study music mm -hmm. in other oh, countries, yeah. right? It's not just music. So I, I teach at Susquehanna University, which is a liberal arts uh, college uh, in Central PA. And I got there, I think, in 2007. And in 2008, they put a new curriculum in for the students, which required every student to study abroad to graduate. Um, so it could be the typical semester abroad, or um, faculty were asked to start start um she wants trips. her she wants her backpack you can get your backpack <laughs> yeah, she can get you your, get it, you can get your backpack get your backpack and you can bring it in here i can't go with you no you, you can just go, go it's right out there just go get your backpack and you can play with that so just pretend you're on an airplane <laughs> <laughs> but um this program started and, and uh so many faculty were asked to start these uh cross-cultural trips basically three three weeks three and a half weeks um and i would say there's maybe 50 or 60 throughout asia um there's south africa wow. there's europe there's south america there's central america how wonderful so yeah all of our students now since 2008 have to have to do this to graduate and that changes everything, doesn't oh, it? Oh, it does. Yes. And I many mean, they our, learn yeah. about the world. They learn about Absolutely. different attitudes. Yeah. I mean, she wants her backpack. I think. Well, well, you can go out and get your backpack. It's okay. It's okay. You're <laughs> hungry. Oh, there's wow. a food out there. You've got your. Go get your food. <laughs> We're <laughs> almost just. Just yeah. give us a little more time to talk. <laughs> You're a little bit on. By the way, let me interest first that <laughs> Naomi will be. Uh, performing at the Keavali Congregational Church on Friday at 7.30. Yep. Uh, that's at uh, 5300 McKenna Road. Mm -hmm. And it's at 7.30 p.m. And it's a free admission event. There'll be an intermission and refreshments served by the congregation committee. It's a beautiful... I, thought, I think that's a really nice it, touch. Very nice of them. I and, really and, like and that, that they can, you can serve refreshments. It's like yeah. you're hosting some, someone's, like you're going to someone's home, and mm -hmm. they're treating you like a nice guest. They really are that way, and, you know, then the audience, you, you all out there are going to attend. You can walk out of the, that beautiful stone 
structure and uh, across the lawn under a canopy kind of set up and to have the, the, the refreshments. And so it's, uh, again, uh, one of those uh, miraculous events for us that uh, we keep uh, pinching ourselves that, okay, it's it's happened again. Well, so. you're able to do this because you're so good at grant writing. You're able to you get know, grants so to be able to provide the free these admission. free admissions. So we, we Free have concerts, the uh, Hawaii yeah. Tourism Authority Community Enrichment Program, the Hawaii State Foundation Culture and Arts, the Casasa Foundation, the ABC Stores, uh, Edward T. Cohn Foundation, AHS Foundation, and others that have uh, continually or uh, continuously helped us over the years. Oh, yeah, because it's expensive easy, to bring the people over and yeah. to get the locations yeah. and provide that. Is yeah, just because it's free admission doesn't mean that the artists aren't paid no, and all yeah. the rest. No, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and as you know, the advertisement and, oh, the, yeah. and uh, associated uh, tasks around promotion of the concert, the travel. Uh, the next day, Saturday, this Saturday, Naomi will play at the Atherton Performing Arts Studio in Honolulu. Oh, really? She'll do the same program, yeah. Nice, nice. So that's so you were going to say something about, I, I saw you recognizing and thinking about the teacher part and, and and having a teacher that clicked. Did you find yourself needing a very specific teacher? Because you have My a unique style of playing as well, and, and well, a teacher so important. Part of that is Robert Helps, because he had a, a special, he had a teacher named Abby Whiteside, who had a very special approach. It wasn't fingers and wrist technique. It had to do with more power from the back and the shoulders. Really? Uh, you know, using all the levers mm -hmm. of the of the body. So that, that, that kept, that's kept me going to the extent uh, m there's, you know, another performance left in me that that yeah. keeps me going so it and probably saves the hands and the yeah, wrist from arthritis and tendonitis and things have and not had those problems yeah mm -hmm. um, was that on the east coast because you yeah. were from new, yes. was it new jersey right he would robert helps when um, we were in uh, graduate school at princeton he would travel from new york and go down the to the bowels of the music department in the basement you make and, and Princeton teaching. bowels <laughs> and rather an interesting place and, to visit. And teach. <laughs> I've been to Princeton campus, and yeah. it's an amazing campus. Yeah. And, of course, some very, very famous people came from Princeton. Yeah. And uh, he would teach private lessons. So, wow. you know, a group of us, maybe a half dozen of us, would take uh, lessons from him. And I didn't know you went a, to Princeton. Yeah. I had and, no idea. Uh, no wonder I call you comp the professor. In composition. Uh -huh. My degree is in composition. But that this is sort of extracurricular for um, people like me. But that was uh, perhaps <laughs> some of the most influential teaching uh, overall that was given to me. So to have you two been able to connect about the influences of this amazing teacher man? And you, obviously well, you've done two CDs on him. It's interesting because yeah. I, I got to meet Abby Whiteside maybe oh. five years ago when Spectrum was doing, we did uh, the Helps Chamber music. So I, oh, it was before she passed she, away. That she was still I, alive. Yeah, well, I think she passed away maybe three or four years ago. Oh, I don't know, but I, I did get to meet her. And the teacher she that... She must have been quite old. Or she was, yeah. yeah. Yes, I went up to her apartment and, and met her and uh -huh. spoke with her for about an hour. But mm. um, it's, it's interesting to hear you talk about this because yeah. my, my the most influential teacher for me when I was at Eastman as a kid, she had long retired with Maria Luisa Faini, who mm. is the same thing. Her whole premise was weight. Mm. You know, mm. arm weight, back mm. weight, and, you know, and yep. getting the hand to, to, to be able to support that weight. And, and my first lesson, I think I was eight years old, and I went to her house, and it had one of those, you know, the round piano benches that you yeah. turn, which, which are not very comfortable, yeah. right? And I remember sitting there. My first lesson was two hours long. She spent two hours on the first eight bars of a Mozart sonata, oh my working gosh. on sound yeah. and production to get me to hear yeah. it and to yeah. develop my hand. And she, she's created my technique, and I studied with her from about eight to maybe 13. Mm. And... Um, you know, I can play 10 hours a day, 12 hours, and, I, and I've never been injured because it's all yeah. gravity and weight, yeah. and you, you use your big muscles, which can, you know, your back, your stomach, you know, those can take the abuse. Your yeah. arms can't. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And it's, it's generally it's, applicable, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. slicing onions away. <laughs> you know, just I, I go, really go, from, the go yeah. from the shoulder. I had never. It's, it's, it makes sense. It's completely you know? common sense, but, yeah. but everybody gets caught up uh, in the yeah, fingers, everybody's, you know. 
but it's, this, it's complete and hand common position sense. and yeah, all this. Absolute common sense. And, yeah. and mm -hmm. the proof is in the pudding. Obviously, mm -hmm. helps played mm -hmm. amazingly. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the sound, an but it's the sound quality that's you know beautiful too, mm -hmm. which is from the the use of weight and not muscling it. Yeah. It's amazing. I'd never, ever considered that mm -hmm. before about peeing. You know, there's a whole different feel when you're doing, like you said, mm -hmm. playing for hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, the concept of that is, is pretty interesting because we don't necessarily, in other forms of music, think of playing that long. If you're in the studio even, you might play three, four, five hours. But, uh, but that's, you know, when you think of playing that much yeah. and rehearsals, it's another whole way and attitude. Uh, and again, surviving that mm -hmm. and... When you, we we talked about your your kind of ascension into it and to the point where you decided you really wanted to go to the New England Conservatory, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but what took it to the level when you graduated to mm -hmm. know that you wanted to continue to play? It's not necessarily evil easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not easy to find a place to to play sure. all these unusual pieces of music. And I know mm -hmm. Robert knows mm -hmm. most all the people in the in this particular field. Mm -hmm. But how did you discover? Well, I, you know, I, it's funny because when I was at NEC, I, uh, several teachers had tried to get me to play not even new music, anything written past the late 1800s, and I absolutely refused. I, I really? Refu I refused. And uh, so I, uh, when I finished at NEC, I ended up going to Stony Brook for my master's and doctorate, mm -hmm. and Gil Kalish is there, mm -hmm. who's a very big new music pianist, but he's also known for his Haydn. Um, and I didn't go to study with him for new music, really, but I, I went there in the summer before, between my undergrad and, and master's, I was a fellow at Tanglewood. Music Center, which is the How summer nice. home for the BSO, and they do a bunch of new music there. And for some reason, because I was going to Stony Brook, I was pegged as the new music pianist, <laughs> even though I had not done a note of new music. So yeah. I got thrown everything that summer. Wow. Um, and just a bunch of new music, and, and I, I just kind of got thrown into it, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I enjoy playing new. I also really enjoy my, my Beethoven and Schubert. Um, so I don't think I could go one way or the other. I like being able to do both. What was Tanglewood like? I mean, it has oh, such an amazing it was, reputation. It, it's, it's so it, I, I think it's still an eight-week program, and it's um, open to orchestra musicians and pianists and singers, um, and they're, you know, college, uh, undergrad, and masters, and I don't know how many students, maybe 80, 90 students. Is it a summer program? It's a summer program. Mm -hmm. It's it's fully covered and, and paid for, and you basically have eight weeks of you live in a – it's actually a girls' um, boarding school during the summer. We use that, so that's maybe 10 minutes away from the Tanglewood grounds. And, you know, it's eight weeks of lessons and coachings and concerts, and you're, you're, consist you're constantly playing um, and constantly going just from, you know, you find out tomorrow you're going to have a coaching on such and such a piece, and you go to the library and you, you learn it as fast as you can. And, um, and it's, it's a great place. I mean, I, I, I have made friends there from the first summer that I'm still in contact with in the music world. And it's a great place because if you can survive eight weeks there, <laughs> um, you know, you can pretty much, you know, survive anything. I mean, there, mm -hmm. there's days where you're at the piano from 7 a.m. till 10 o'clock at night, nonstop. There's been some famous yeah. concerts and TV mm -hmm. broadcasts mm -hmm. from Tanglewood, and mm -hmm. it's got a huge reputation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it was that 100th anniversary of Leonard Bernstein TV show that was done from there, maybe? I mm. I don't know if you saw it I mean, on he PBS. Was a, yeah, he was a big presence And there, it was so amazing, sure. you know, mm -hmm. um, absolutely amazing. It was mm -hmm. a tribute to him with a lot of pieces. Mm -hmm. People haven't heard of Leonard Bernstein mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. done from there mm -hmm. with some of the great musicians, you know, that was doing that as well. So, I mean, it's, it, you know, when you think of how your life could have gone, mm -hmm. to where the journey mm -hmm. of your life mm -hmm. has gone, mm -hmm. um, it's been a, a, an amazing trip that you've mm -hmm. taken from when you began and <laughs> you're mm -hmm. going to Japan to here to, you know, mm -hmm. now Pennsylvania and then traveling around mm -hmm. to do these mm -hmm. things. I guess you never could have ever imagined. Uh, and when did you finally get that you were, your life was going to be unconventional? <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, it's, I don't. You don't I, think it was not unconventional. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's luck. A lot of it is there's so, so many great musicians, and especially pianists. Oh, my gosh. They're, they're just <laughs> yeah. there's zillions of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's really a lot of it is luck and being there at the right time or, or connections. And, and um, you know, it's, it's, you, you just never know. Well, there's also a lot of hard work involved. In uh, there is. It's a lot of hard but work. But a lot of people yeah. do a lot of hard work. That's true. You know, there's so many of us. That, no, that's true. Know. And I know a lot of new age um, pianists, mm -hmm. pianists that are 
are friends of mine that mm-hmm. like playing New Age, and I can mm-hmm. understand why. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just kind of dreamy and nice, mm-hmm. and it you know carries you and mm-hmm. yeah. and um, An- antiseptically void of dissonance. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> That sounds and rather <laughs> judgmental. <laughs> Antiseptically <laughs> void of dissonance. Anyway. I de- you know what? I think of New Age music because I have a lot. Of, in fact, yeah. remind me of a lady that won a Grammy in New Age. Her name is Laura Sullivan. Mm-hmm. And you, you're very mm-hmm. much similar with your hair, your look, and your whole thing. And she's got a lovely child. <laughs> no, I mean, you're very. And, and I mean, in first look, I think she reminds me of Laura yeah. Sullivan. And she's a wonderful mm-hmm. lady. And she's a piano teacher, and mm-hmm. she's got a daughter. She mm-hmm. teaches piano, too, mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think of it not as antiseptically <laughs> void of dissonance, but more that she is really on a different en- energy yeah. level of po- trying to play free thought. Mm-hmm. It's like poetry versus, you know, reading a different, mo- you know, mo- mm-hmm. novel of a different sort. And, again, it's just different brain waves, you know, and different ways of interpreting, I think. Yeah, you know, the, there's, there's a good commentator the, the other day who said that the, we, we seek art sometimes to escape. And that's probably where new, the I think new you're age right there. music is yeah. But we also seek it to understand better our reality mm. and that's where our concerts come in it seems to me that mm-hmm. uh, that uh, if we can w- w- grapple with you know these wonderful compositions that every piece on this program by the way friday at 7 30 congregational <laughs> church 7 30 it's free admission for all of you and it's going to be an excellent program, wonderfully conceived. And all of the pieces are extremely difficult to play, by the way. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but she no didn't d- back mas- down from it. Never ma- back mas- down from it. No. <laughs> and they're all, uh, in a way, they're not difficult to listen to. They're, uh, they're tonal, many of them. But they've been impacted, affected by what Schoenberg did at the beginning of the century in terms of freeing the dissonance. So there's there's that aspect, but and it's unfamiliar wait, wait, music. So freeing the dissonance. Did you use this? Another interesting turn of the and, phrase: and, freeing the dissonance. Well, that's what they said: emancipation of the dissonance. I like that term. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, you have done, and, and for those not familiar with Robert, you should be, really, because you just celebrated 20 years of doing these amazing yeah. events. But you have done events where you have um, amazing abstract artists mm-hmm. create art while you're doing the music. And, and, again, tying that thread together from abstract art to music is interesting because abstract art um, is free, but at the same mm-hmm. time it is free because it doesn't have the form, right? And you've seen amazing art created by Tony Walham and others who have been able to create with this music and interpret it in interesting ways. But again, you don't have to get in a lot of the details in abstract art, you know. And and in a way, I look at some of this music you do as abstract as well. Yeah. Uh, But but interestingly, again, this concert will be uh, music that, except for the Schoenberg, which is extreme, these are extremely abstract miniatures, but the other pieces, the Janacek in the Miss, is a, is tonal. You know, it's a very so those heavy, listening that might piece, not understand. Let's beautiful. just make sure they understand when we say tonal, tonal yeah. what tonal so, means. Yeah, if we had a keyboard or something, but you know, based on the C major uh, s- sphere, a, a, a harmonic sphere around uh, the, the, these. Uh, chord these uh, chords that you might drink, be drink, called. Drink. Now let's bring might, it back. No, 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 no. That's chords I, of nature. To, you might let's, say. Let's just say Wait, it's mm. easier to listen to. Depends. <laughs> depends. You know, okay. Depends. okay. But, uh, it's so more melodic. Can we say that? Would that be? I'm trying to keep it basic so people understand what tone. Well, again, have. you know, there was a some commentator once said there's more uh, melody in a three note tune of Webern than there is an elaborate <laughs> tune of Mahler. <laughs> so, you know, it depends on what you... What, no, the key is the un- unfamiliarity. Of uh-huh. it. And we know from our Maui audiences mm-hmm. out there that they, that is not a hurdle from, for them, that mm-hmm. they are willing to jump over that unfamiliar territory mm-hmm. and receive what they're listening to. And I'm glad you, that you, I think you aptly described that, Robert, mm-hmm. because it is. At first, you may not understand the language. It's a foreign That's language it. to many people if they haven't really been listening to it. And there's not a lot of radio stations or places that play this music. You know, you mm-hmm. have to be searching it out. 
on YouTube or different different venues. How do you get your music played? I have to ask you that. That's How do you get find places to play your music, Naomi? But, but man, yes, well, okay, you can. That, that, you, can that her, you can listen to Naomi on YouTube. Okay, oh, Naomi Niskala YouTube. Just Google that, and you'll get a whole array of uh, which these, helps. Uh, yeah. I didn't know that. These you help. didn't know it? I didn't know that. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a <laughs> pun, <laughs> too, because it's Robert Helps. So oh, which okay. helps. Uh, okay. <laughs> you didn't realize you were in YouTube. You just, I, you just I, other I, people no, recorded them and stuff? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because that's Through part of it. Through our website and our Facebook page, you mm -hmm. can link as well oh, to that. Oh, that's good yeah, to yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, musicians these days, a lot of them don't have people. It's very expensive to have marketing people doing your work, as you know. I mean, you know, minimum what three, four thousand, maybe. You know, if they're going to start getting out mm -hmm. there and doing publicists, publicists, good publicists cost a fortune. Yes. So a lot of musicians I know have to do their own, um, and it's very difficult because you know, marketing a product. I mean, you're doing a new. This is going to be on a CD that you're also work a new CD you're working We're on. Working isn't on it? a fifth CD, fifth, fifth commercial CD, yeah. And for you it works and because because you can sell your works to the people who come to your events, but it's difficult otherwise yeah. selling what you're doing. And Naomi will be recording for us while she's here as well for, where, the, where for are inclusion. At your place? Uh, uh, it's a Melalana studio, uh, Jamie Lawrence's studio. Oh, Jamie's in, place. In Makawao, yeah. Nice. And we've worked there before, so she will record the one of the pieces uh, by Vivian Fine called mm -hmm. Five five preludes, which are really, again, very tonal in uh -huh. a way, very difficult, but lovely, capricious, also somewhat short uh -huh. uh, preludes. So, and then she plays the Roger Sessions Sonata Number no. 1. Uh, this is a gorgeous piece. And again, I've heard it's of Roger uh, Sessions. Yeah, he's I don't one of America's great composers, yeah. if you have to say, who was... And, and uh, th this piece begins in B minor. It's it's a you know, large tonally based. It it expands you know the horizons of tonality, but it's. Uh, did you again, pick the program, or no, did Naomi not really, pick the pro no, Naomi no, no, pick the program? Yeah, yeah. And it so happens that her interests in the, in twentieth century music coincide with ours, uh -huh. particularly the works of Robert Helps. But Sessions has been one of our. Uh, composers that we have on our programs, and Vivian Fine, who was a student of Sessions, uh, is someone that we've championed on our CDs and in live performances. So when you now, do your CD, you mm. you do it from you lately in this last one, it's a combination yeah. of people who've played at various different concerts that you put mm -hmm. on. Yes. And then you make a compilation. Yes, from different sites, recording sites, mm -hmm. and then we put it together. And, and then, then we send it out to be mixed and mastered? Yes, we mm -hmm. have a wonderful mastering engineer, Da Hong Situ, who's a Grammy award-winning uh, recording engineer, and he's put together the master of the uh, the whole uh, group of pieces. So. And there really, is there anyone else doing exactly what you're doing? I don't think there's anyone, is there anyone out there doing what you're doing, Robert? Well, there are, uh, there's, there's a, there was a recent article about us in um, on Maui magazine, the last issue, not this current one. It's called, and they say, "New Music Nation," which is a term we sometimes use. In that there are these pockets of activity all over the world, small, like in Seoul, Korea, for example, where really? we have an exchange. Uh, in, um, of course, in some of the metropolitan areas, you have a lot of modern music. Chicago, right. New York, apparently, New York has it. Yeah. Um, but here in Hawaii, we're the only group that has been promoting. The and Hawaii you find out because it. it's a closed circle. I mean, you just go to certain you sites and you find out about Seoul because of certain musicians who've come. Well, you had the concert with some of the musicians. We ha we're having another one. We're supported by Korean American Hawaii Foundation, and we'll have something in February. That had to do with um, a friendship of mine from graduate school days. Uh, colleague Eugene Lee, who was Korean, who after he went to school moved to Seoul, and after we moved to Hawaii, we get, regained contact, and uh, then we started this exchange uh, program where we had already started in New Jersey, but it sort of intensified when he um, moved to Seoul. 
uh, I went out there in 2000 to do a recital, then went back another time. Uh, we commissioned Eugene to write a piece we, for quartet. We performed it here in um, Three Islands, and uh, we're still doing that. He he founded something called Veritas Musicae. It's a again a modern music foundation organization Is that in, in Seoul? Seoul. In Seoul, that's wow. been going since you know the 80s, probably or 1990s. Do some of these places like that get funded by the government? Or are they privately it's funded? It's not certain to me wh which, how they are funded. They may very well be privately funded. There's a lot of that going on, yeah. you know, in Asia. Uh, you get uh, individual sponsors, sp individual and sponsors, and that. Have uh, you ever been able to get a sponsor, Naomi? Have you found sponsors to help you? No, no, mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's hard. Yeah, it is, yeah. It's it is difficult to find a sponsor. Mm -hmm. And and sponsors sometimes do come with strings attached. Mm -hmm. I, I I've known musicians who've had sponsorships and they expect certain things in the posts that you post and the mu sometimes the instrument that you play mm -hmm. and I've th even heard of sponsors saying that they couldn't play other instruments when they were on tour uh, or else no pictures could be taken if it's another instrument yeah. that, if it was a, a company that mm -hmm. sponsored their sure. instruments right mm -hmm. sure. so then mm -hmm. you'd get into like well I can come play but it's got to be a Yamaha mm -hmm. or it's got to be you know it's a, mm -hmm. so yeah there are things that come with sponsorship but you've been kind of free of that with what you've been able to accomplish with your sponsors, which thank God for that, because they know you already and what you're doing, right? Well, it's a, in a sense, it's a positive thing that these many of our the foundations, like these Amphion and the Roger Shapiro Fund, uh, focus on certain the promotion of certain contemporary composers, like Amphion is Elliot Carter, Amphion is Dina Costin, Edward T. Cohen.